Good morning. Um, Good morning. I have to apologize for my dress because we actually have introduced casual Fridays in the office, so taking advantage. Um, okay, this is the title of my talk, and it's going to be arranged in the way I usually pattern my talks, which is before we want to know where we want to go or where we should be, we have to sort of figure out how we got there. And it sometimes goes back a pretty uh, long time. Now, this started with an experience I had. And if you haven't had this experience, can you guys see the screen? OK. Um, there's this exhibit in the Ayala Museum. And if you haven't had a chance, it's a very good uh, thing to do, especially if you have uh, friends and uh, relations from overseas or you have an afternoon to kill. It's a gold exhibit, pre-Hispanic gold in the Yale Museum, the largest collection in the whole country, and the finest collection. And it has all sorts of amazing things like this belt. Um, and you can tell a lot of the way people approach things by the sort of comments they make around um, exhibits like these. Uh, as a one-time journalist, you know, we like to snoop. And so when this exhibit opened, I just followed people around and tried to overhear what they were saying. There were people who would focus on the design, what it meant, where it came from, others on the purpose. It's a belt, but why would you wear a belt like this? And I'm sad to say many, many more people who were just interested in how many ounces this way. And from there, you could really tell that the good thing about an exhibit like this is there's something for everyone. These are all people who never even thought we were capable of stunning items like this, which I always tell my foreign friends can pretty often put the Egyptians to shame. Um, but again, each person brings to the table their own perspective and their own way of looking at things. There's this other uh, really stunning item there, which is a sort of, it's called the sacred thread, and it comes from Hindu tradition. It's a sign of rank and nobility. And weighs in the kilos. So for those of you who have friends who really will not care about the workmanship and the craftsmanship and the history, you can say it's one of the biggest, heaviest bling items you'll ever find. But it got me thinking. Things like this got me thinking. The whole idea that Filipinos and foreigners alike, when they come and see something like this, it opens up a whole territory in a world that is completely alien to them. And perhaps this is what Filipinos tend, tend to be angsty about. It opens up a world that they were never taught about, they never imagined, uh, and still have difficulty sort of getting their heads around. Which brings me to something that's a very nerdy uh, um, interest of mine, which is maps. And it's something that is disappearing in terms of the education people get. For those of us who are a certain age, maps were an essential part of the learning process. I don't know if it is as much anymore, and I think that's a pity, considering how technology can make them much more interesting and useful. But here's a map which I could spend the whole day talking about, but I'm just going to boil it down into what the three primary colors here mean. We have this little spot in the world where some of us live permanently and some of you here are living temporarily. But if you were to go back to the era when those golden threads and those belts were made, there were three separate things going on. And these three separate things were not going on just then, but they seem to be going on up to now. And if you want to understand why we are all Filipinos and yet we can all be so different, why where we come from can influence even the things we eat and the things we like to do and the habits that we uphold, it would come from this. So let me start with what the blue ones. And this is basically condensing hours of conversations with archaeologists and historians all of whom are doing incredibly interesting work that no one knows about, except maybe other archaeologists and historians in other parts of the world. 
you could start with what this blue, what these blue arrows mean. And it is from a conversation I had with an archaeologist friend. And he was saying, you know, if you go over to the Philippines and basically the, our country remains so rich when it comes to archaeology that you can just basically dig a hole in the ground in any field and you'll find something. You may not find gold, but you'll find pottery and you'll find holes from where they have the lintels of houses and that sort of thing. And you're saying you can basically break it down into two orientations. And now it seems that if you were to dig around the Visayas, their orientation was to Thailand. The pots and pottery and china that they dig up seems all to have come from this part of the world. But if you were to do it in uh, Pangasinan, Manila, other parts of Luzon, that's where you find the Ming vases and all the other fine china and, and other decorative items. And that was their orientation. And it just shows you a whole different perspective in terms of the items that these people found valuable and important. If you were to go to the red triangle, it's not the Bermuda Triangle, but it's an interesting sort of triangle too. This is scholarship that's being done by a man named Eric Casino and others. And basically, if you want to understand how life was, it would have been this triangle that if people were getting on their little boats and traveling, following the seasonal winds, trading, and as the, um, the writers put it, it's trading, raiding, and feasting seems to have been the preoccupation in those days. It would have been this way. It would have been a route from Luzon down to Palawan, through Mindanao, and then to North Borneo. Another one would have been from Luzon down to the Bicol region, Leyte Samar, what we now call Cariaga, down to eastern Mindanao. And the third is from northern Mindanao down to North Borneo. And again, it shows you, it's those three concepts, raiding, trading, and feasting. The capture of slaves, the trading of slaves, the trade of beeswax, of durable goods, of gold, of which we have always had a very large supply, and feasting, which is something Filipinos up to today are quite particular about. And the third is, and this is the most theoretical aspect of all of this, is the orientation. If you were looking out the window, some of us will buy a condo because we want to be looking over the golf course and others will want, don't mind looking over the cemetery because it's more peaceful. But in that sense, what were the sort of orientations of the different parts of our country and the people living there? Again, if you're in Luzon, your orientation is to China. And there are many signs of this for the same reason that the Ifugaos come from the same sort of uh, tribal groups that are there in Taiwan. They have the same sort of rice terraces, and that sort of thing. The migration must have been this way. If you were in Mindanao, your orientation then and up to now, for any of us who have traveled in that part of the world, it's not to this part of the world. It is to Borneo, to Indonesia, and that part of the world. And this I found the most interesting. The Visayas is oriented not to Southeast Asia, but to Polynesia. And it may be that if you want to figure out where our love of roast pork and all of that sort of thing came from, it may be part of our Polynesian heritage. So they look out <clears throat> towards Saipan and towards Guam. And for all we know, the large number of Filipinos in Hawaii may actually be not due to their being brought there as plantation workers in the 1920s, but may have an even longer history than we can possibly imagine. But again, this is just so different from what we're used to. It's a perspective so detached from what we're taught. And yet, to my mind, if you were to sit down and just think about it for about 10 minutes with people from the different parts of the country that you encounter, and the more you explore their traditions and habits, the words in their languages, it starts making sense. And it starts helping us understand why sometimes 
they don't, we all expect everyone to look inwards this way, but they're just all looking outwards in different ways. Another time, I went around to Kiapo. All of us go there. And of course, this is a part of us that no one can ignore. Whatever your current faith, so much of what we are is determined by our heritage from Spain. And talking to some Spanish historians, especially the younger ones who are doing a lot of new research, you'll have to excuse my very crude scribbles. This is something that emerged from a very intense conversation I had with a young Spanish historian. And it was so intense that I'm still trying to decipher what some of my scribbles meant. But essentially, what does this sort of rough box show? He says, if you were to ask a Spaniard at the turn of the 20th century, at the end of the era of Spain, and many of those who have been educated under Spain, if you ask them, what is the Philippines? It would be this box. This whole big stretch. To them, that was greater Philippines. It is not the way we think about it. It is not the way, perhaps, those who founded our country think about it. It is an area that stretches from the part we know of the Philippines down to the border of Saba, all the way to Guam. And one fact, for example, is that up to the point of the Treaty of Paris, Guam belonged to the Archdiocese of Cebu and was administered from Cebu. It stretched all the way down here, almost uh, encompassing the Caroline Islands, as I said, up to Guam, Palau, and all of these places where you still find a lot of Filipinos. And he says, <clears throat> this is not just a theoretical um, idea, it was the way actually things were done. That if the Philippines in turn was considered a dependency of Mexico, then the Philippines itself had its own dependencies that looked to the Philippines for administration and control and were influenced by culture and intermarriage and tra trade and travel. But this is something that is gone. I mean, except for a few Spanish historians, the Spaniards themselves. If you ask them, what is the Philippines, will tell you it is this. So it's a perspective that can change very quickly, even though this perspective developed over about two, three hundred years. There's the idea that we are a single entity. This is the famous painting of the Philippines and Spain by Juan Luna in the Lopez Museum. It's a gorgeous painting. If you've never seen it, it's about eight or nine feet tall. Um, beautiful colors, and of course, has a particular view from the time of the Ilustrados of the Philippines and Spain being sisters, with Spain as the elder sister, and they're both going up the path of progress. Now, images like these are, in a sense, part of our comfort zone. Luna would have painted the Philippines, and we would continue to imagine the Philippines feminine, exotic, on a slightly, perhaps, junior level compared to those who are their equals in other countries. And yet, one person, one whole. 